Are you good at Unix file system permissions, or do the bad guys run circles around you? Let's have a look. Micro Challenge 1. Alice is in group staff. Can she read this tomato file? Can she write to it? Micro Challenge 2. The system administrator has the current directory at the front of his path. He's not very good. How can user Alice exploit this to gain root privileges on the system? Micro Challenge 3. The permissions say that the file secret.txt, owned by Bob, is not readable by Alice. What Unix commands would Alice type to display the secret on screen anyway? If you can fire up your Linux virtual machine and show me the correct answers for all three, feel free to stop this video now and make better use of your time. Otherwise, welcome to Frank's Diana Explains. I'm a professor of security and privacy at the University of Cambridge, and this is the Part 1b security course for my second year undergraduates, which is one of the most exciting things I teach. Today's topic is the basics of access control and file system security. This video is pretty dense with information, but if you follow through to the end, you will be able to solve the three micro challenges I just threw at you. Don't use pre-made hacking tools. Just use your brain. My purpose is not to turn you into script kiddies and make you memorize a bunch of tricks. My point is to allow you to understand how things work. If you understand the core ideas, you can figure out plenty more things, even if you've never seen them before. To make matters concrete, we'll talk about POSIX file system permissions. POSIX is an IEEE standard describing Unix-like operating systems. Details for other systems, like Windows, will be different, but the core ideas will recur. As you become a professional computer scientist, learn the principles and learn how to learn the missing stuff on demand. Prepare to be a lifelong learner throughout your career. This is a pretty hands-on course. To get the most benefit from it, learn by doing. Needless to say, hack around to your heart's content in your own sandbox, but stay legal at all times. Install VirtualBox, download the seed virtual machine I mentioned in the past lecture, and whenever I describe anything, try it out in the virtual machine, replicating my examples and creating your own, and trying out any extra questions that may come to mind. What would this command do? Well, try it out. Uh, what's the exact syntax of chmod? Well, type man chmod. If I say something and you just hear it, after a while you will only remember 10 or 20% of it. If you redo it yourself, then you'll remember more like 70 to 90 percent. You'll need the seed virtual machine to do the seed security labs, which start from the next lecture, so you might as well install it now and start using it straight away. It's very convenient to have a safe playground where you can make as much of a mess as you like and then easily revert to a previous snapshot. Feel free to add user Alice, add user Bob and so forth while you're in there and explore your own scenarios. And also refresh your memory on your Unix tools and operating system courses from last year while you're at it. Access control is a necessity in a multi-user system where Alice, Bob and Charlie share the same file system. Alice would be none too pleased if Bob could read her email, nor would Bob like it if Charlie could edit the file that contains Bob's curriculum. They all expect the operating system to enforce some protection on their own files so that other users cannot mess around with them. But while it's fine to say only the US is allowed to open files and the US will only open files in compliance with our stated policy, in practice the US, the US function that opens a file ultimately gets translated into machine code and machine code is all the processor sees. But if the US can access the file with Bob's CV when it's Bob who is asking for it and who's Bob uh, when it's Bob who's invoking that function, then what is there to stop Charlie from issuing exactly the same machine code instructions that that function uh, translates to, even though Charlie is not allowed to call that function from the OS? If the operating system had to check every single machine code instruction before execution, as opposed to just checking who's invoking an OS uh, function call, then the system would slow down to a crawl. What we need is processor level support for a privileged mode of operation, which is commonly indicated as the supervisor mode. Simply one bit in the hardware that says whether the processor is in real mode or supervisor mode. And then if you have that, you can meaningfully say that some operations can only be done while in supervisor mode. And so long as you carefully regulate how to get in and out of supervisor mode, then you can build an entire multi-user operating system on top of this facility. 
the Intel 8088 that the original IBM PC was built on did not have that bit. It did not support the supervisor mode, and that's why the MS-DOS operating system that ran on it never was, and never could have been, multi-user. But once that bit is there in the hardware, then this sets the scene for a recurring battle we will be exploring repeatedly in this course, namely privilege escalation, uh, which means entering supervisor mode from real mode when you were not supposed to do so. Last year, you were exposed to multi-level secure systems and the Bella Pagina security policy. Subjects and objects have security classifications such as unclassified, official, secret and top secret, and information is only allowed to flow upwards, never downwards, as dictated by the two rules of Bella Pagina that say no read up and no write down. This is mandatory access control in the sense that even the four-star general who's clear to top secret has no say about the rules and he will not be able to write an unclassified memo no matter what he says because that would violate no write down. The kind of access control we'll be looking at today is instead discretionary access control where for every file the owner of the file makes up the rules on who can access it and how. Discretionary access control could be fully specified by listing for every file F and for every user U in the system what operations, if any, U is allowed to perform on F. You basically get yourself a big matrix with one row for every file and one column for every user. And in each cell you would have a list of the allowed file access operations. Reading the matrix by rows would give you the permissions on a given file while reading it by columns would give you the capabilities of a given user. So the matrix would be a complete description, but it would be enormous and it would be a pain to manipulate it. Every time you create a new file, you'd have to specify access rights for every user in the system. For this reason, practical systems usually adopt some, some kind of simplification, such as adding a level of indirection and considering groups of users instead of just uh, the individual users one by one. In POSIX, the access control permissions on a given file are not described for every possible user, but just for three cases. The owner of the file, the members of the files group, and everyone else. POSIX defines users, indicated internally with integer IDs, with the ID of zero, indicating the privileged root user that corresponds to the administrator role. This root user may create new users and may impersonate other users. POSIX also defines groups which are named sets of users and they too are indicated internally with integer IDs. Each user belongs to at least one primary group listed in etc password and possibly other groups listed in etc group. The UNIX command ID is convenient to display the current user and the groups that the user is a member of. Each file has an owner and a group. The file system is arranged as a hierarchy of nested directories, each of which may contain zero or more files or directories. A directory is itself a special file that contains a mapping between the files, uh, the file names and the inodes. An inode is an internal data structure that contains pointers to the disk regions that contain the bytes of the file, and then uh, also file system metadata, anything you may think of except the file name, because the file name is not stored in the inode, but as we said, in the directory, which is a mapping between the file name and the inode. Several entries in the directory, or in several directories for that matter, may point to the same inode, meaning that the same the same file, the same bunch of bytes, may be known under different names, all equally valid and all uh, peers to each other. These names are called hard links and they can be created with the command ln without the minus s, which instead creates symbolic links. An important item of metadata that is stored in the inode is the permission bits. There are 12 such bits arranged in four triplets, of which here you can see the bottom three triplets. The top triplet is a bit subtle and hidden and we'll get to that uh, in a moment. Since three bits represent the integers from 0 to 7, it is common to represent these triplets as octal numbers. The bottom three triplets refer respectively to the permissions granted on this file to the user, the group and others. For each of these roles there are three bits in the triplet. 
R if you can read the file, W if you can write to the file, and X if you can execute the file. These are the letters displayed by the familiar ls-l command that you've already seen a million times. If you have the permission, then the corresponding letter is displayed. If you don't have the permission, there is a dash in that position. Directories, which, as we said, are special files that map file names to inodes, have the same triplets, but the semantics of the permissions are slightly different. R means you may read the directory listing the files that it contains. W means you can write to the directory, which means you can add files into it, you can remove files in there, you can rename files. X does not mean execute, which would be meaningless for a directory, but it means that you may change into that directory and that you may dereference the inodes, meaning you may access the metadata that's in the inodes uh, and you may access the content of the files that are listed in that directory. So if you have the R but not the X permission on a directory, you may list the file names in it with the command ls, but you may not see the permissions or even the length of the files uh, with ls-l. You change the permission mode of a file or a directory using the chmod command. Change the mode. It has a relative and an absolute form. With a relative form, you add or subtract permissions from the permissions that the file already has. For example, you add read permission to group and other with chmod go plus r photo jpeg and you remove execute permission from all with chmod a minus x photo jpeg and you can even combine them with uh, a plus w comma g minus r or you can use the absolute form where you say what you want the permissions to be using the equal sign rather than the plus or the minus as in u equals rw comma g o equals r so so far this was the symbolic form with the letters u g and o for user group and other and a for all and then of course r w and x for read write and execute besides that there is also the more nerdy octal form where you just write out the same stuff in octal so r w and x uh, are worth four two and one respectively and you add them up to form an octal digit in Octal, you can only use the absolute style, not the relative one. So, chmod664 photo JPEG uh, will set it to rw dash rw dash r dash dash. The chmod command only works if it's issued by the owner of the file or by root who can do anything. You can also invoke chmod recursively on a directory with a minus capital R. Check the man page for all the details. The way the operating system checks these permissions to see if a file access operation should be allowed or not is perhaps less elaborate than you might think. First of all, if the request comes from the root user, then it's granted with no further questions asked. But then, if not, the OS first decides which of the three triplets applies, and then it only uses that one, nothing else. If you're the owner of the file, the user triplet applies. If you're not, but you're in the group of the file, then the group triplet applies and otherwise the others triplet applies. That's it. Only one of the triplets is ever checked, unlike in other systems. So if you are Bob in group staff, the middle triplet gives you these rights. But if you are Alice, who's also in group staff, your rights are the ones from the user triplet, even if the group triplet would give you more rights. And so it's possible, counterintuitively, for the owner to have fewer access rights than the group, and even the unwashed masses in others. That's pretty uncommon, actually, but it's technically possible, if rarely useful. The file owner, and optionally also the file group, can be changed with the chown command. For example, chown bob colon stuff potato will set the owner of potato to bob and its group to stuff. But only the owner of the file, or root, can change the group, and only root can change the owner. So Alice can't actually change Potato to be owned by Bob, not even if she's feeling especially generous today. This used to be possible in some early versions of Unix, but devious users were giving away large files that made other users go out of quota, and it also made forensic investigations harder by making it easier for attackers to hide their tracks. So now, in POSIX, only root can change ownership of a file. The SU command which stands for substitute user, lets you temporarily impersonate another user, provided you know their login password or you are root. 
SU opens a shell under the identity of the other user. To go back to whoever you were, exit that shell by typing exit or by terminating the input file with Ctrl D. If you forget under whose user you're working, you can just type who am I or for more information, type ID that we mentioned earlier. With SU minus L, which can be abbreviated to just SU minus nothing, uh, you get a login shell and you are moved into that user's home directory. Otherwise, um, you are just in the directory that you ran SU into. If you omit to specify a user, then just SU will switch you to root. As ever, consult the man pages for all the details. Now, changing to another user is all very well if you are authorized to do so, but it is often a better idea to do that as little as possible, especially when switching to a user with higher privileges than yourself, such as root, because then uh, you are not protected against involuntarily causing damage. For example, deleting files that uh, you would normally be protected against deleting. It's better to follow the principle of least privilege, first formally expressed by Jerry Salzer in 1974, and only use elevated rights for as long as this is strictly necessary, but no more. This can be achieved with a sudo command, which executes just one command as the super user, sudo as in su do this command. You can restrict which users are allowed to use this uh, sudo facility. The user who runs sudo is someone who has the authority to run as root all the time, but wisely decides not to do so. It's basically a self-restraint application of the principle of least privilege. But the principle of least privilege can also be applied to the cases where the subject is not trusted to be granted root privilege, and yet that subject must perform some action that they cannot do as themselves. And it is to solve this problem that the more elaborate mechanism of set UID was invented. As a motivating example for set UID, consider the problem of allowing Alice to choose a new password for herself. As we'll see in a future lecture, the information related to login accounts and passwords is stored in system files called etc. password and etc. shadow. We don't want to allow Alice to write to either of these files and even read etc. shadow, otherwise she could reset the passwords of other users and give herself access to their accounts. At the same time, we do want Alice to be able to change her own password in a self-service fashion because it would not be scalable if the sysadmin had to be involved every time every member of the whole organization had to change their password. But there's no way that the Unix permissions will let us say something as complicated as Alice can write to this file, but only to her own line in this file and only to a certain field in that line and uh, the other lines she can't change and she can't even see. That's clearly too fine-grained. In order to be able to specify access control restrictions with such pedantry and with arbitrary flexibility, you would basically need a programming language. So uh, what you might do is you could write a program and say that you granted permission to do exactly what the program does, no more, no less. So Dennis Ritchie invented the set UID mechanism to do just that. It was so clever that Ritchie's employer, AT&T, patented it and then smartly released the patent into the public domain so that everybody could use it, but nobody could take it over. The set UID bit says that if you execute this file, then it runs not with your privileges, but with the privileges of its owner. This is where we reveal what the fourth topmost triplet of the permission bits does. The top three bits are set UID, set GID, which is the same thing for groups, and the sticky bit, which is unrelated, and I'll tell you about it in a moment. With Chmod, you can set uh, these bits in octal using a fourth digit to the left of the others, or you can set them symbolically by using S for set UID or set GID, as in Chmod U plus S to make the program set UID, or Chmod G plus S to make it set GID. As you can see, the password program is owned by root and is set UID. So when Alice runs this program, then uh, it is allowed to edit the etc. password and etc. shadow, even though Alice herself has no permission to write to them. The way set UID works under the hood is that each process keeps track of a real ID, the one of the user who launched the process, and an effective ID, which is the one that determines the privileges that are granted to the process. Normally these two are the same, but if the executable was set UID, then the effective user ID gets initialized to the UID of the file owner, not of 
the file launcher. It's okay for the process to drop privileges and revert back to the real UID after it has done the special thing in order to comply with the principle of least privilege. There's a system call to set the effective user ID from within the process, which is the one we're looking at the man page of, but it is fairly restricted in the changes it allows you to make. Obviously, you can't acquire arbitrary privileges just by invoking the function. And essentially, all you can do is go back to what you were before. So for this reason, the process table also contains a third user ID called the saved user ID, precisely to allow a set UID process that dropped privileges to reacquire the elevated privileges later, which you wouldn't otherwise be able to do because you would have lost memory of what the privileged ID was. So with that said, we may now revisit the second micro challenge from the start of the video, where there was a sloppy sysadmin and a user Alice who wanted to become root. The shell is an executable called bin sh, which is owned by root. If Alice could make the shell set UID root, then she would be able to execute any commands as root. Unfortunately for her, if she takes a copy of bin sh, the copy will be owned by Alice. So if she makes it set UID, then the copy will be set UID Alice, not set UID root, which will do her no good. If she runs it, she is still Alice. So what Alice needs to do is to trick the administrator into making a copy of the shell for her and making it set UID while he is root. She can prepare a simple shell script to do that, and then she must social engineer the system administrator into executing that script. This is not too hard if the sysadmin is dumb enough to have the current directory as the first entry in his path, because Alice can call her devious script with the name of a frequently used command, such as ls and then stick the script in her home directory and then come up with some plausible excuse why the sysadmin should check her home directory for some problem that she can't solve on her own. And then if he executes ls as root in her home directory, then he will actually be executing Alice's script and unwittingly creating a set UID root copy of the shell for Alice, which will give Alice root privileges if she executes it. Now, what I have shown is a very messy attack, and to do things properly, Alice should hide her tracks a little better. She should make her script actually behave like ls, so as not to arouse suspicion when root types ls and nothing happens. She should make the script self-destruct after having performed the copy, so that the sysadmin uh, can't actually go back and inspect if he becomes suspicious. Uh, and she should be cooking up a scenario that actually forces the sysadmin to run ls in her home directory to figure out what's going on, and so on and so forth. I'll leave those extra frills as an exercise for you, but the core of the solution is what I've just shown you. And the moral of the story, besides not putting dot on your path, is that the sysadmin should have used the principle of least privilege and to investigate Alice's complaint. He should have been looking around as Alice, not as root. Another permission-related feature worth knowing about is the umask, which lets you restrict the initial permissions when creating new files or directories. By default, newly created files would get permissions of 666, meaning everyone can read and write, but not execute. And directories would get 777, which basically gives all the permissions. The umask says which of these default permissions should be turned off when creating a new file or directory. So if you say you mask 0 to 2, which is a common choice, then it means you want to turn off the write bit for group and write bit for others on every new file and directory that you create, which leads to 644 for files and 755 for directories. So the permission on the new object is the default permission and the negation of the umask. You would normally issue this umask command in a startup file such as your .profile. I promised I would tell you later about the sticky bit. Okay, in ancient times, when RAM was measured in kilobytes rather than gigabytes, a lot of swapping to secondary storage was necessary to get anything done, which made the system really slow. The sticky bit was used to mark frequently used executables so that the OS would keep them in RAM instead of swapping them out and then bringing them back in. Now, this is now obsolete and no longer relevant. However, a few years later, 
this bit, which was there anyway, uh, was given another meaning and another purpose when applied to directories rather than to executable files. And that was done to address a totally unrelated and somewhat obscure problem that uh, arises with shared directories. Imagine that all the users of the system share a temporary directory. Clearly, every user needs, at the very least, the right permission on this directory in order to be able to uh, create their own scratch files in it and uh, execute permission in order to read back the content of those files. Uh, and it's also uh, not a bad idea to have the uh, read permission in order to list the content of the directory, but that's not as essential as the first two. But anyway, uh, with those permissions, uh, with, with W and X permission, the users can also rename or delete other people's files, as Bob does here with Alice's file, and, and that's no good. So setting the sticky bit on a directory means that even if Bob has W and X access to the directory, he can only rename or delete the files that he owns, not the ones that uh, are owned by Alice or anybody else. So this feature of the sticky bit is most commonly used with slash temp, but it could in theory be applied to any directory. In the symbolic format for chmod, the sticky bit is indicated by the letter T, as in chmod O plus T slash scratch, and it appears as a T in place of the last X. Remember that you only really learn the things that you do yourself. To get the most out of this security course, install the Seed virtual machine on your computer and try out for yourself all the things I showed you in the video. Ask yourself questions about stuff I didn't say and answer them by experimenting. Check the Unix man pages whenever you need the exact syntax of a command. You will need the Seed VM to work on the practical exercises from the Seed labs, which start with the next lecture, so install the Seed VM in VirtualBox now and make sure it all works, including stuff like shared folders. By now, you are in a position to solve the micro-challenges I gave at the start of the video. You go back to the start and reconstruct the solutions on your own. To see if they are correct, try them out inside the sandbox environment of your seed VM. Create your own Alice, Bob and Charlie accounts with AddUser. The more you play around, the more you learn. I've given you pretty heavy spoilers as we went along, and here is one more for the third challenge. Read the man page for find. It's pretty long, and at some point it will tell you about the minus exec option, which I'm sure you can put to good use. In our next lecture, we will do privilege escalation by abusing set UID root programs. If you're keen, you can get a head start on that by attempting the software security, environment variable, and set UID lab. Note that you get no course credits for completing the seed labs, but I will reward those of you who do by making my exam questions much, much easier for those of you who have actually done the practicals. If you're a member of the elite who watched the video until the end, let me know with a comment mentioning old shoes. Thank you very much for watching, I hope you're enjoying my course, and I'll see you in the next video.